I'll jump right into it. I think PWSA um, had the FDA, um, you know, come in and there was, a, you know, the um, in front of the FDA, there were a few great sessions um, last year. But one of the most important things that I got of it, uh, out of it was this word cloud. Uh, PWSA asked, uh, you know, all the uh, families in attendance what the biggest issues are that are uh, that the families um, and the patients, um, you know, struggle with. And it's interesting, if you look at this word cloud, um, you know, skin picking, tantrums, anger, outbursts, extreme behaviors, impulse control, it's full of behavioral issues. And that speaks to the, and food seeking is there, obviously, it's a big problem, but then uh, uh, the vast majority of the burden of illness faced by the families and the patients seems to be um, the behavioral issues. So there is a, a, a cascade of dysfunction in PWS. Uh, just to touch upon it briefly, uh, that that small part of our uh, of the chromosome, uh, you know, of the you know uh, one out of the twenty three pairs, um, the fifteenth chromosome, and that to a small segment of the long arm, fifteen Q eleven dash thirteen, wreaks havoc uh, on our uh, patients and loved ones. Um, you know, and uh, you can see the genetics there. Uh, it's the genetics ha have been studied quite well. We understand. Um, quite well what these genes do um, at this point, and all signals point to the hypothalamus. Another, you know, two gram small pea-sized uh, organ of the body that is uh, not functioning well in folks with PWS, leading to all of the different manifestations. Hyperphagia, chief amongst them, also, um, you know, problems with body composition, low lean body mass, um, you know, low hormones such as growth hormone, increased fat mass, and of course, the behavioral abnormalities. Now, in order to understand the behavioral issues associated with PWS, especially the chronic issues, the longer standing issues, we need to think about what is the normal functioning of the, of the brain and, and how that might be affected. So one of the chief functions of the brain is response monitoring, which is the, our capacity to flexibly adapt to dynamic environments, right? So when there is uncertainty, right? So like I was, uh, you know, we started instead of 12 p.m., we started at 12.3 and Lynn was getting nervous, right? And, and Lynn was getting nervous because I joined at, at just like dot at 12 instead of five minutes before. So this was a cre uh, this created a sense of uncertainty, right? And she got, Lynn, I'm going to pick on you a little bit, but, but just, uh, you know, as an exercise, she got some extrinsic stimuli. Oh, she looked at the clock. She said, okay, it's 12 o'clock. Deepan is not here, right? And she got some intrinsic stimuli. She might have started sweating a little bit. She might have started feeling some butterflies in her stomach. She might have started feeling, having the physiological response of anxiety. So that's the intrinsic stimulus combined with the extrinsic stimulus, right? That there's an uncertainty in the environment. And she had to reconcile, her brain had to adapt. So she sent me a couple of reminder emails, which I saw later on. Uh, and, you know, but, but her brain was engaged in response monitoring, right? So the subcortex, right, prime amongst them, the hypothalamus, collected all the information from the body, sent it to the cortex, the higher functioning part of the brain, in which there was planning. Lynn was like, okay, let's send in a couple of emails. Let's send an email to his personal email and his work email. Let's uh, think about, you know, what will happen if he's a, five, a few minutes late, can we? So she must have been, you know, there was a whole set of things that helped her adapt, right? Effectively, she did not lose control. She didn't quit her job. She didn't curse anyone out. You know, she didn't cancel me the meeting, right? And that is response monitoring. Now, the hypothalamus is a key transit center of the brain that 
health with response monitoring by connecting these extrinsic and intrinsic stimuli and helping convey the higher function of the brain to the rest of the body that everything's okay, everything will be fine and leading to an adaptive response. So if the hypothalamus is not working well, all of these downstream effects of adaption, you know, of adapting to uncertainty, uh, they're not working well either, right? Leading to a maladaptive response, anxiousness, impulsiveness, aggression, getting stuck, right? So if I don't, if things don't go a certain, you know, direction does not like, don't, doesn't follow a certain set of events, I'm, I'm not going to be able to function, right? Uh, you know, um, confabulation is part of it. So making up stories to explain the uncertainty rather than being able to adapt to it, right? Um, and then skin erector excoriation, I think, has a different path to it, but uh, definitely gets worse during uncertainty. So these are just some of the things that will help you understand uh, the issues in higher functioning. Uh, one of the things that happens, uh, and this is, again, something that I haven't published yet, I've been working on it for a couple of years, but I haven't gotten around to publish, is, you know, uh, my, uh, my contention is that uh, this breakdown of response monitoring leads to response perseveration, right? The inappropriate repetition um, of a response despite the absence or cessation of reward, right? So one would expect that, you know, they keep doing the same thing despite, you know, being told or seeing that it's bad for them. Why is that happening, right? And and that's because of a lack of response monitor, effective response monitoring. Um, and it looks like compulsivity, but it's not OCD. It looks like anxiety, but it's not an anxiety disorder, you know, uh, like generalized anxiety disorder or panic disorder, right? Um, now, this slide goes over the, the gamut of behavioral issues in Prader-Willi syndrome, right? And one has to, um, to and I, I'll spend some time on this slide because, uh, you know, before jumping into, into treatment options, um, the, we, we have to think about behavioral problems in folks with PWS as chronic versus acute things that are there, you know, at, at their baseline, wherever they are at, and what comes up episodically. They were fine, and then all of a sudden, or, you know, just over the last few days to weeks, things have changed, right? Um, so chronically, there are developmental issues. There are learning disorders. There's um, you know, autism spectrum disorder. Um, and I think the, the, I got these percentages from some of the, and I can send references if needed, but uh, in, in a recent uh, review that I, I had looked at, 41% actually to me sounds less, right? It sounds like an underdiagnosis of uh, autism spectrum disorder, but that's because there is still controversy about what to cause of autism. But, but I, I want to emphasize to everyone who's listening today that it is important to diagnose autism. Don't attribute everything to PWS because autism is a lot more common than PWS, which means that there's a, there are a lot more resources available for autism, right? It opens up a whole new world, right? So for example, if uh, someone is uh, in the Midwest or in, in another country outside of the United States where the resources are uh, fewer, they are looking for an expert in PWS. They may not find any, but if they look for an expert in autism, they will most likely be able to find someone. And there are there is enough overlap in symptoms that they'll get at least some help, right? Um, not only that, people who treat autism are used to treating other neurodevelopmental problems, and they're probably going to be more open to learning about Prader-Willi syndrome. So that's something that one should keep in mind. And in the United States, you will get, uh, or, or more developed parts of the world, there are more resources, public resources and funding available for autism than for PWS. So enough said about autism. 
Uh, intellectual disability is a little um, deceptive when it comes to PWS. There's a whole spectrum, obviously. There are people who are nonverbal all the way to like really high-functioning uh, folks. Most people will have mild to moderate intellectual disability. And if you look at the entire, um, you know, um, sort of spectrum of, uh, of test results, you'll see that executive functioning and, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, can um, lags behind. However, language is usually pretty well developed, right? Okay. So now speaking directly about um, other be behaviors, skin picking is actually the most common amongst uh, behavioral issues out, out, other than hyperphagia, right? Uh, some, you know, anywhere from 55 to 100% based on the reports that I've seen will have some amount of skin picking, right? Um, obsessive compulsive symptoms are very common uh, up to 60%. ADHD symptoms are very common and underdiagnosed. Again, people make the mistake of attributing the symptoms to PWS rather than diagnosing the, comorbid, uh, the comorbidity, which can actually be treated, right? There may not be a treatment for prader willi syndrome, but there is a treatment for ADHD, okay? So if there is a comorbid condition, we should talk about it. I'm, I'm going to deal with the mood and psychotic um, episodes separately, and then, you know, um, we will go more into it with the next presentation. Um, but let's talk about hyperphagia just a little bit. You know, so hyperphagia is um, unceasing. So basically, again, going back to the hypothalamus, right? The hypothalamus takes signals from the body, ghrelin, adiponectin, insulin, right? And gives, and basically their, the appetite, the satiety center of the brain predominantly resides within the hypothalamus. Because of that not work, working well, it leads to a lack of satiety. Um, and, you know, there's controversy of, about whether or not to call it hunger, but increasingly I've been talking to patients and they very clearly, those of them who are, who are more verbal and more comfortable will recognize it as hunger, they call it hunger. And uh, they are experiencing it um, pretty much all the time. So all that to say that hyperphagia we only rec we only see the hyperphagia hyperphagia related behaviors right food sneaking stealing asking for more food you know that kind of stuff but there also there's also cognitive hyperphagia even before they start engaging in behaviors related to hyperphagia they're already preoccupied because of the hyperphagia now that leads to a cognitive load, right, which is overwhelming in many patients, especially once hyperphagia starts be becoming worse eight years, usually eight to 12 years, and, and becomes a predominant uh, behavioral symptom, it overwhelms the ability to have impulse control in folks with PWS and may lead to a lot more of the other behavioral problems. Okay, the aggression seen in prader willi syndrome is reactive in nature, which means that because of the impulsivity um, and, and poor, because of poor impulse control predominantly, uh, they are unable to sort of exercise control and they act before they can think and, um, you know, um, uh, be able to stop themselves from hurting another person or yelling out loud or screaming. So that, that you know, irritability and aggression is predominantly, um, you know, uh, it's non-malicious, right? It's not planned, it's impulsive in nature. So when a patient of yours uh, or a loved one of yours is going through, is experiencing uh, irritability or aggression, Again, the first question to ask is whether or not it is chronic versus episodic. So I'm gonna jump right into treatment now with the caveat. The caveat is that as a psychiatrist, I'm gonna focus what I'm gonna say right now in the next you know, five, six minutes on medications, okay? And I'm assuming that you've already 
you know, you're already, your patient's already working with the behaviorist, you have all the resources that you can use. Now, if the region in your patient or your loved one lives in the world, if they don't have adequate behavioral support, that doesn't mean that they can't get medications. You know what I mean? Medications have, you know, it's a technology which is more widely available than other forms of psychotherapy. That's just the fact. And one should take advantage of that access. Okay. Um, so, but I'm not going to be able to talk. I don't, it, it's outside of the scope of today's conversation to talk about the other behavioral treatments available. Okay. All right. Irritability, aggression. If it's chronic, an episodic treatment would be different. So again, if it's episodic and it's coming suddenly, the patient is not usually aggressive and is starting to get aggressive, then we have to think about other symptoms that are also occurring. Is it because of irritability coming from depression? Is the patient also displaying other features of hypomania, mania, or psychosis? And if that's the case, then the treatment would be treating that cause for the aggression, right? An antipsychotic, a mood stabilizer, an antidepressant, right? Um, ADHD symptoms, if, if it's chronic, usually you will also have some ADHD symptoms, right? Um, you know, and if there is a, a lot of ADHD symptoms, you can think about either going the stimulant route or even with or without ADHD symptoms, my first line treatment for irritability and aggression, Bradley syndrome, especially if it's chronic, is alpha-2 agonists, in particular guanfacine extended release, which I've done quite a, quite a bit of uh, research on. Um, sertraline in low dosages is the only antidepressant which has good enough evidence at low dosages, and I mean like 50 milligrams or less is what has been, uh, you know, what was described to me by the uh, group in Germany that was doing the study, right? So these are really low dosages. And, uh, and it was pretty safe at those dosages and I've done, I've treated the same way. And uh, I haven't had any patients at those, do those low dosages develop um, psychotic features or mood activation. However, if the patient has a history of psychosis, mania, then uh, I would avoid SSRIs completely unless they're already on an antipsychotic or mood stabilizer. So it does get complex real fast, okay? In which case you want an, an uh, you know, if the patient has ever experienced psychosis in their life, it's better to have a mental health prescribing provider, you know, psychiatrist um, involved in the patient's care. ADHD easy to treat, low-hanging fruit, okay? And it's important to, to address it. Um, if the patient has excessive daytime sleepiness, right, um, then you, uh, then it is, you know, okay to go with stimulants as first line. Um, on, but if there's no sleepiness, if the, if the sleepiness is not significant, I would suggest starting with alpha-2 agonists. And then if that's not enough, right at a good enough dose and that again for guanfacine would be uh, guanfacine extended release would be anywhere from two milligrams all the way to seven milligrams the starting dose being one then increasing it to two see how it goes and you can increase the dose gradually up to seven milligrams skin picking first line treatment would be nac um, and acetylcysteine and 1800 milligrams twice a day <laughs> is sort of an, uh, you know, an acceptable uh, early dose, but you can go even higher than that. Um, but uh, you, can, you can start at six milligram, uh, 600 milligrams twice a day and go from there. If, if there's inadequate response to that, again, guanfacine has been studied for it and has shown, uh, you know, um, benefit. Topiramate can be used. Naltrexone has had mixed results. Topiramate, in my experience, ha is sort of an under-recognized, um, you know, a resource. Uh, that's the only um, medicine that I could find 
uh, which has a double-blind placebo-controlled trial, which has shown reduction in hyperphagia. And we don't prescribe it enough. Um, the dosages are, uh, you know, really the study dosages were uh, 100 milligrams twice a day. Okay. So slowly building up to that is can be helpful. Uh, psychosis, I will, you know, just say this much because we will have more about this. Not schizophrenia, okay, that's important note. Um, in some cases, psych psychosis can be persistent. I've had only one patient in which, uh, you know, the symptoms didn't completely resolve within a couple of months, okay? There's a sudden alarming change in behavior, there's sleep disturbance, catatonic features, uh, confusion, voice hearing experience, often paranoid delusions, and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, usually there is a reduction in food-seeking behaviors, which is quite, you know, different from their usual presentation. And uh, they usually respond very rapidly to antipsychotic treatment or, or lithium. I don't, I'm, I'm not a big proponent of lithium uh, for long-term use, um, but antipsychotics, I've found them to be, you know, them to respond quickly and you can keep them on a low dose maintenance treatment for a long time. Um, and this is uh, just uh, some of the work that we have uh, published. Um, okay, so if there is psychosis, right, um, psychotic symptoms, uh, then antipsychotics are the way to go. And like I said, lithium could be a second choice if antipsychotics for some reason are not uh, recommended. Um, we discussed enough about guanfacine. I want to leave enough time um, for um, Dr. Forrester, uh, you know, just wanted to touch upon a couple of quick studies. If you guys uh, are in the United States and you have patients who would be candidates, um, you know, vagal nerve stimulation um, ha is, has a lot of uh, promise. Um, and it's a, it's sort of a, it's an FPWR, you know, uh, you know, supported study. And, uh, you know, we are conducting it, it in Brooklyn and there are other sites uh, in the United States. Happy to answer questions about this. Uh, this is, uh, you know, another quick study for excessive daytime sleepiness. Um, you know, if, uh, if you have patients who have excessive daytime sleepiness due to any cause, um, you can, uh, you know, have them call my center. Uh, it's an innovative, uh, you know, study, first of its kind in PWS. It's 100% remote. We can't ship it outside of the United States. That's the only thing you should keep, you can keep in mind. Um, but the patients get to keep the device and the Fitbit that comes from uh, with it. Um, quick study, six weeks, it's over. All right, and, and this was six years old and up with sleepiness. Uh, this is the phone number to call if there are um, any questions, um, and there's an email address there as well. And I'll, uh, and you know, just my book, um, you know, Lynn mentioned that. Um, I'm, I'm really happy to say that, uh, you know, at this point, people from across the world have reached out, uh, you know, um, talking about the book and how it's helped their loved ones. And uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity.